Over the course of a lifetime, a single human being can produce over six tons of excrement. But despite its importance, it remains a subject of great taboo. So, for those with a delicate disposition, whenever we refer to our number twos, or feces, stools, turds, shit, crap, droppings, and poo-poos, we'll be using a more fragrant code name, the rose. We will be facing our greatest taboo head-on as we examine our roses in detail. We'll be looking at medicine, our physiological well-being, at history, what they tell us about our origin, and technology, how these fragrant little buds can be used as an energy source and even as food. Our fascination with the floral has even led alchemists and artists to transform it into gold and even create machines that produce artificial flowers. So come with us on a rose-strown voyage of discovery. We begin our investigation in France, one of the few countries where doctors specialize in the subject. They're called proctologists. Why, doctor? The proctological consultation is difficult. It is difficult because it deals with highly taboo areas, that is, the anus. Women say that they'd rather see a gynecologist than a proctologist. With men, it's always difficult. They're either disgusted or attracted by the act that can be associated with homosexuality. So you can see that all these elements must be taken into account and that the consultation must be conducted slowly so that these fantasies can be allayed. How is it when you're away from home? Really bad. It's not good at all because when I'm away from home, I just don't go to the toilet. I don't like going to the toilet away from my own home. Once I was away for two weeks and I didn't go the whole time. And what about your stools, the size of your stools? Yes, they're small and dry. Mostly we see patients who have a problem with defecation, be it diarrhea or constipation, who suffer from intestinal discomfort. The colon functions independently of the patient's own wishes, so there's no point in being brutal. You have to allow the inner being to express itself. We each have our own personal rhythm for our bowel motions. In France, a so-called normal stool is estimated to weigh about 150 grams. So how do we produce our daily bouquet? After we swallow, food travels through the esophagus and onto the stomach, where it is dissolved by a cocktail of acid and digestive juices. Its next stop is the seven meter long small intestine, where bacteria help to absorb all the nutrients contained in our supper. What's left passes into the large intestine and then the colon. Now our supper is 95% liquid, a highly concentrated mineral-rich stock, providing our bodies with vital energy. Anything left over becomes a little floral tribute to our meal, traveling on to its final destination, our rose reservoir. Defecation has to be de-dramatized. They must be given the right conditions. There's no need for the whole office to know which key you farted in. The sound and the smell. The sound? Yes, the thing about how women don't fart, don't go to the toilet, don't smell bad, and it's very embarrassing to have gas when there are people around. So, with bloating and gas, there is also the issue of the infamous nasty fart, that gas that poisons the whole atmosphere. So it's important to know that these gases are uncommon, representing only about 1% of gases. They are in fact gases that are formed from protein substrates and which, through the sulfuration of indoles and scatoles, give rise to quite strong odors. We can evacuate up to a liter of gas every day. Here's some captured with a thermal camera. There are stools that float, quite intriguing for many patients. In fact, it's simply because the stools contain methane. And this methane has the property of making stools float and also of being inflammable. This rather singular occurrence was widely publicized in the newspapers at the beginning of the 20th century. 
because farting was deemed entertaining. Joseph Pujol, a fart artist, even performed at the Moulin Rouge. Today, we prefer to keep our emissions under wraps. We all need to accept the fact that all colons move, breathe and evacuate air. That's all there is to it. Fart happily and feel better. But not everyone agrees. According to Lenin, even the throne was a symbol of waste in a capitalist society, an unnecessary luxury. What a marvelous surprise it would have been for him to discover that the Soviet Academy of Medicine would produce a great number of films about our rose-making machinery and that a colon cleansing tablet would be christened the Kremlin Pill. The Soviet president, Leonid Brezhnev, swore by its effects and the pill rapidly became all the rage despite costing an exorbitant 50 euros. In fact, these former Red Army officers are so keen on their favorite colon cleaning remedy that they will happily search through their little floral bundles to recycle them. The metal-coated pill emits electrical impulses which causes the intestinal muscles to contract and any hard-to-reach stubborn petals are shed with the pill and the rest of our rows. The pill is a high-tech jewel in the crown of our thrones, composed of two electrodes and a microprocessor. Here? And here? That's it. I advise you to take the Kremlin pill. It will help you to regulate your intestinal transit. The desire to cleanse the intestines is completely ridiculous. This desire is based solely on fantasy. From a physiological point of view, it's nonsense. The colon does not need cleansing. There is no call for purging, irrigation, inventing goodness knows what utensil for emptying and cleansing the colon. It is pure fantasy. But this fixation with the benefits of colon cleansing is hard to eliminate. It's deeply rooted in our history when purging was a trend. Our roses were once a major preoccupation. They were sniffed and classified according to color charts. In those days, people produced two to three times more poop than today, because our diet contained more fiber. And if a doctor couldn't help, the men of the church may even have been given a little floral tribute. For over 550 years, the Japanese have been calling on Ususama Mio, the Indian god of defecation. Offerings to the god are made by slipping a coin into a hole, which looks rather similar to a Japanese toilet. Eating well, good digestion and good defecation are signs of good health. This is all very important. The worshippers who come to this temple are mainly elderly people who are afraid of developing problems like incontinence. To eat well and defecate well is a barometer of health and this God takes care of that, so I come to this temple to thank him. Followers of this religion light holy incense to heal their colons and buy sacred underwear in the temple shops of Mi Otokuji. I often suffer from a bit of colic, which is why I come to this temple every year to make it better. If I wear the underwear I buy here, I'm fine, but not with those I buy elsewhere. Our preoccupation with our bowel movement stretches back thousands of years to a time when our ancestors suffered dreadfully from intestinal parasites. How do we know this? Brazilian professor Adalto José González de Arrujo collects fossilized feces, or coprolites. He's studying the mummified movements of the first American Indians, 
These crumbling coprolites are over 2,000 years old, and he's made an exciting discovery. Ancient intestinal parasites stacked among his samples is enough evidence to rewrite the history of America. 25 years ago, when we began to study the feces of mummies, there was a great risk that we would get no results. But today, with over 3,000 feces examined, our conclusions have called into question the accepted theories about how South America was populated. It is this intestinal parasite found in the stools of a Brazilian mummy that inspired his theory, and the key was working out where it could have come from. Experts thought the first American Indians traveled from Asia via the frozen Bering Straits. The parasite which reproduces in feces had been found in Asia. But scientists discovered that it could not survive in cold conditions, and it's never been found in the mummies discovered in the North Pole. However, the parasite would have easily survived the migration from the warm archipelagos of Polynesia and Micronesia. Adalto has no doubt that South America's first inhabitants came with their intestinal parasites on warm sea currents and not over the frozen trails of the Bering Straits. He's so confident his theories are correct that Adalto has decided to visit his patrons at the Osvaldo Cruz Foundation. He needs more support for his research. These are coproliths from mummies from Brazil for my research. While he waits for more funding, Adalto gets on with his day-to-day -day challenge, finding enough high-quality feces to support his theories. In his files, each rose is painstakingly described in the finest detail. Every piece of information must be recorded. Rose hunting is not without certain disadvantages. Even dried roses secrete a slight odor. Quando nós recebemos coprólitos no nosso laboratório, when we receive coprolites in our laboratory, they're mostly well preserved because they're dehydrated. To rehydrate these dried coprolites, we put them in a trisodium phosphate solution for 3 to 20 days. After this time, the consistency and even sometimes the odor of the feces are restored. The smell is down to the bacteria in each little bloom. It may be thousands of years old and mummified, but it is still fragrant. Just 100 grams of our personal waste may contain thousands of bacteria. Our roses are made up of 80% water and 20% microorganisms. Our daily waste contains 300,000 million friendly bacteria, plus dietary fiber, unchewed fragments, insoluble mineral salts, and our own cells. In one day, the inhabitants of the planet produce more than 12 million tons of roses. That's a bouquet with a powerful perfume. At the Chemical Senses Center in the United States, researchers are sticking their noses into the matter. Professor Pamela Dalton is preparing a rather unusual cocktail. We were studying malodors, in particular human feces, because it's recognized no matter where in the world you go. And there's no culture that really likes the smell. We have some very new bathroom malodor here that smells a lot like feces, and I'd really like you to take it out and test about 25 people, both in the bathroom and in an outside context. Getting something? Ooh. Okay. So, tell me about what you're smelling. Oh man. Oh. What's that um, like? Honestly, mm -hmm. uh, it kind of smells like someone just went to the bathroom. Um, it smells kind of artificial. Okay. I don't know. Um. It's not bad, but it's not 
it, it's, it's unpleasant, but it's not terrible. How familiar would you say it is? Does the perception of the odor depend on the visual environment? We are exposing our subject to the same odor, but pairing it with different images, which are meant to help her sort of associate it with an odor source. And that source could either be a very pleasant source or a rather unpleasant source. And we're trying to see how those visual images will change her ratings of odor pleasantness. Now you're seeing some flowers on the screen, so I want you to rate how pleasant or unpleasant the odor is. Oh, and you can see an immediate change in her breathing rate. She's trying to hold her breath. Yeah. Her heart rate is increasing correspondingly. It's a human waste odor. And so it's been validated as being really disgusting by uh, hundreds and hundreds of people. But when we pair it with some other images like Animal Farm, we found that it's not usually perceived as unpleasant as when it's clearly recognized as being human waste. When we smell an odor, particularly a very bad odor like human feces, the first signals are sent to this area called the primary olfactory cortex. All odors activate this area. But when an odor arouses us emotionally in particularly a bad way, the amygdala starts to show activation, which is part of the limbic system. The pungent aroma of our waste products triggers the part of the brain that controls primitive emotions such as aggression, fear and pleasure. When we think about different cultures and their responses to odors, we can probably think of the Japanese as being one of the cultures that are most sensitive to body odors. In most cases, they live in very close proximity to one another, and there's a real important effort not to offend someone else with what might be considered unpleasant body odors, either from excrement or underarm odor. But the Japanese may well have found a solution. Take this pill and it will eliminate the odor of feces by decomposing the ammoniac and trimethylamine components that cause these odors. Mr. Uchida claims he can make a rose smell sweeter, but do tests back up his theory? These are pills that eliminate odors from feces. Please try it to test its effectiveness. We'll meet again in three days. Thank you. So, what do you think? It works. My husband was also very happy because the toilet odor has disappeared. My stools are yellower and the smell has gone. Good. If you continue to take it, you will get even better results. Thank you very much. The success of his product means that Mr. Uchida has a loyal following amongst young women and even men in Japan. He's sold more than a million boxes of pills since 1994. But today there are over a dozen similar products on the market, including some that claim to transform even the most aromatic offering into a green tea perfume. Mr. Uchida needs to get back on the streets to boost his sales. Just take one pill. Should I chew it? No, you must swallow it. Have some water. I swallowed it. With this product, you take one pill after every meal, and it eliminates the odor of your stools. I already have some. Trying to counteract malodors, such as the smell of feces or bathroom odors, is probably one of the most intensive quests in industry and research today. There have been ways of uh, attempting to do this that have been tried in some areas, whether it's influencing the diet of people to change the way their body odors smell, I have to say, at the present time, there is absolutely no magic bullet that will do this. Our problem is that one rose hides millions of others. 
In our attempt to eliminate the sight and smell of roses from our everyday life, we have created millions of kilometers of sewers leading to huge poop processing factories, sewage treatment works that filter the water and collect and transform our roses into mud. But we still have the problem of what to do with the sewage mud and the smells it produces. I'd like you to smell these samples of sewage mud, products derived from the treatment of human waste, and to grade them according to their odor from very strong to neutral. Thank you. The only other animal to produce more fragrant little flowers per year than humans is the cow. Recycling our waste mud has become a major challenge. It's expensive to turn waste into something inoffensive. Many small sewage works produce mud with a less than fragrant perfume. Pour sortir des discours à l'eau de rose, il faut reconnaître. We need to take off our rose-colored glasses and face the fact that we are in the crap and we are in it for two reasons. The first reason is that to evacuate the waste of city dwellers, we found no better solution than using tap water. This tap water evacuates feces and wastewater through the sewage systems to the sewage treatment works at a concentration of one gram per liter. The extraction of this tiny gram from the wastewater requires the implementation of very expensive technologies. Problem number two is that nobody wants this tiny gram extracted from wastewater, which means that today, on average, 50% of the water bill paid by city dwellers is for the management of this tiny gram of crap. This pyramid represents the sewage mud produced from the wastewater and feces rejected by the 8 million inhabitants of the Paris urban area over the period of one week. The Asher Sewage Treatment Works in Paris is the second biggest in the world after Chicago. In this temple to the toilet, two million cubic meters of feces and wastewater from Parisians are transformed into mud each day. That's the same as 300 Olympic swimming pools worth of waste. I have in my hands a piece of sewage mud cake. When I break it, you can see that it's not just the poop of Parisians, it's also their toilet paper. And you can see the toilet paper fibers, cellulose fibers. For the few true experts in the field, this mud is high quality mud. This mud, see, it's very dry. It's just a tiny bit sticky, but it's very dry, which means that most of the water is extracted. So it's rich man's mud, because it's the extraction of the water that is expensive. This label of quality is essential, because the mud is sold on to farmers, and that's becoming increasingly difficult. One of the problems of recycling sewage mud in agriculture is the fact that it is feces. And there is a very aggressive marketing line on the part of the agro-food industry. And obviously, feces are not white. Many farmers are afraid of mad mud after the mad cow episode. Today, the nitrogen content of human waste represents 40% of the nitrogen used in agriculture worldwide. There is no ecologically ideal method for recycling sewage mud. Incineration is both expensive and polluting, so while waiting for a better solution, the mud is being marketed. We obtain these pellets which do not smell when spread, an advantage to this previous type of product, a mud that looks a bit like feces. We're trying to get away from this idea of waste. Human waste is now a huge global problem and finding ways to make use of it is a priority in every large metropolis. In Tokyo, we have 12 million inhabitants, and they make lots of mud that is then dumped. But we don't have enough ground for this. So to recycle the mud, we've invented this brick. This brick is no different to a normal brick, but it is expensive to produce, so the Japanese are using it sparingly. This brake sells for 120 yen, that is, less than one euro. If it's expensive, it's because the mud must be baked at 1200 degrees. We're trying to make a brake that will cost less. There's also a rather charming side effect. 
At high temperatures, the mud develops this fabulous shine. And it wasn't long before the Tokyo Sewage Committee made flower vases with the stuff. This pendant is made from sewage mud. We also sell three models of tie clips with the substance, the mud, in the middle. Plated in fine gold and worn around the neck, the substance is apparently most attractive, the perfect provocative detail for Tokyo's young in crowd. In Scandinavia, feces are also used as jewellery, but their preference is for deer droppings. In fact, animal roses have long been a source of inspiration. These roses have been created by an earthworm. Although the shape is stunning, this is not what interests Mr. Marcel Boucher. In a sewage treatment works, there are filters, and filters are a bit like the holes in a sink. They get blocked. The earthworms eat the accumulated organic matter, the debris, including human excrement, and they transform the material into decomposed matter, in other words, gas. Earthworms are the perfect workers, biologically programmed to eat, eject and re-eat any excrement until it is completely decomposed. And what they don't manage to eat as a first course, they leave to ferment in the soil, rather like a good cheese, and eat it later on. This earthworm here is a specialist in this type of matter, and for the worm, this is caviar. Sounds like a brilliant idea. The perfect ecological solution. And it's cheap. See. It's probably less expensive than traditional methods. Why? The process is very simple. The wastewater arrives at the filter, the earthworms are in the filter, the organic matter remains in the filter and the water that comes out the other side is clean. Whereas in the common systems, the putrid water is allowed to decompose slowly with microorganisms and that takes up an enormous volume. It requires large tanks. It's highly expensive. It's very good. There's no odor, which means very good activity. No fermentation? No, no problems. So is it the future? This tank contains hundreds of thousands of worms frolicking about in a mixture of feces and pine bark. It is permanently watered by sewage. And at the moment, the earthworms at this high-class establishment feast on the roses produced by 500 people. But why on earth feed this caviar to earthworms when we could eat it ourselves? Professor Ikeda has invented the first steaks based on proteins from human excrement. In Japan, we produce lots of mud, and the Bureau of Sewerage asked me to find an effective recycling solution. So I began a study to produce artificial meat by recycling the proteins from sewage mud. Sewage mud is rich in protein because it is alive with bacteria. These bacteria are harmless because they are killed by heat during the manufacturing process. The red color is obtained by using food coloring. The artificial steak, according to initial tests, even tastes like beef. In fact, to refine the flavor, Professor Ikeda adds soy protein. It's 63% protein, 25% carbohydrates, 3% lipids, and 9% minerals to make one turd burger. <laughs> This here is artificial meat made from sewage mud. At the beginning of the process, we extract the proteins, and at the end, we add an additive before shaping it with the machine, and that's how we make this meat. Professor Ikeda believes the main problem is the psychological barrier. Since it's made from the substance that comes out of humans, I don't think there are many people prepared to eat it. Artificial meat is several dozen, if not hundreds of times more expensive than normal meat. 
やっぱり何十倍か何百倍するかもしれません。ただこの研究がきちっと完成した段階で実際に。But when my research is finished, I hope that the price of this meat will be more or less the same as normal meat. Otherwise, my research will have been worthless. できるんじゃないかなと。またそうしなければ多分これは実用性はないだろうというふうに思っています。According to Professor Akida, the third burger has an obvious advantage other than completing the food chain. The third burger contains less fat, so it has fewer calories. Bon appetit! In China, the calories of fecal bacteria are used for energy. Mr. Liu Ying is director of the Chinese Biogas Institute. He begins each day with a civic gesture. At the Biogas Institute, all stools are recycled, even those of the comrade director. And it works. The gas from bacterial fermentation is a source of energy. This energy can be used for lighting, heating, and cooking. Mr. Liu Ying checks the brightness of this light bulb between 60 and 100 watts to judge the performance of his bacteria. More than one in ten people in the world use energy derived from the fermentation of fecal bacteria. But in China, biogas is even used to operate factories. In this factory, biogas enables the production of 7 million kilowatt hours per year. This energy powers the five machines in the Chongqing Mechanics Factory. This system was set up three years ago and has always functioned well. Large amounts of waste are stored in gigantic tanks. Careful though, smoking is forbidden here because of the hundreds of pipes full of fermented gas. Individual roses from the employees and neighboring villages are not sufficient for operating an entire factory, so there is a pig farm on site. Pig poop has an exceptionally high bacteria count. The ideal is to mix and ferment together animal manure, which contains much carbon dioxide, with human waste, which contains a great amount of nitrogen. This mixture gives a better fermentation. Over the last 20 years, China has installed millions of recyclers for private citizens. Anyone who builds this type of installation receives a government grant. The first models often leak. The gas pressure became extremely high, so the tank needed to be checked frequently. Otherwise, there was a risk of explosion. The fermentation of biogas requires certain conditions, so listen carefully. First, you need a hermetically sealed septic tank. Secondly, a constant temperature. And thirdly, plenty of feces. Today, being an eco-citizen carries far fewer risks. Modern tanks are safer and better sealed. Today, I would like to show you the latest biogas tank made of fiberglass. It is light, practical and hermetically sealed. Mr. Liu Ying regularly advises neighborhood officials on the joys of rose recycling. Hello, I've come about the biogas. Is the pig pen connected to the biogas digester? Yes, of course. And here our toilets are also connected to the digester. Among private citizens, biogas covers 60% of the energy needs of a household. And it can even be used for cooking. Is the pressure good? Yes, it's fine. OK, good. The pressure's strong. And what are you cooking there? The French scientist Lavoisier said, nothing is lost, 
nothing is created, all is transformed. And the Chinese have not only understood this, they have applied it through biogas utilization, research and distribution. In the countryside, many women choose to marry men equipped with biogas. It is the women who take care of the cooking, and without biogas, cooking is a real chore, as you have to gather wood. In China, we've built more than 10 million biogas digesters in rural areas. And this year, we will build 1 million digesters. In the future, we will try to use the biogas as fuel to replace petrol and diesel to replace petrol and diesel. It's ambitious, but thanks to the Chinese and Mr. Liu Ying, tomorrow we may be driving clean and green thanks to our own fecal matter. 20 years ago, we'd already succeeded in starting a truck motor with biogas. In the future, we will manufacture biogas car batteries that will help reduce pollution. Europe is slowly coming round to the idea of using poop instead of petrol. After all, it is a cheap and renewable energy. Sweden is leading the way with buses running entirely on fecal energy. Biogas is a growing business in Europe, with the equivalent in energy of 5 million tons of oil. But most of the work is still experimental. To produce biogas, we know, is not that expensive. However, to produce other products like lactic acid is still relatively expensive. However, as the oil price increases, the reduce of the availability of petroleum as a material, the product's price will increase. Secondly, the technology will develop, improve. Secondly, the technology will develop, improve. Our main goal here in our research is to improve the process to make it become more economical. Professor Chen is optimistic about recycling our roses in the future. He's had encouraging results on another animal, the cow. We have fiber in our, in our uh, dairy manure, but we don't have so much We have fiber in our dairy manure. We don't have so much fiber in the human manure. In the human manure, the recycling method is going to be different from the dairy manure. However, it can be recycled. It can be 100% recycled. Human manure doesn't have a lot of sugar material in it, but it can be used as raw material to produce bacteria. Some of the bacteria has carbon in it and can be used to make plastics. We got energy out of the shit. We also get material out of the shed. Professor Chen, this rose alchemist, promises us a bright future in which our roses will be transformed into antifreeze, cosmetics and even deodorants. Rose alchemy is nothing new. In the Middle Ages, alchemists tried to transform our flowers into gold. And diviners claimed that the vibrations they detected with their pendulums were identical for gold and feces. Even that's not quite as peculiar as it sounds. Throughout history, poop and gold have always been intrinsically linked. The Incas had their sacred roses. In their language, gold was called the feces of the gods. Few bowel motions have ever been as venerated as those of the great Lama of Tibet. His dejections were thought to be rich and powerful. They were sought after as remedies. People mixed them with their food or preserved them in gold receptacles. Psychoanalysts have even got a theory. If a greedy man accumulates gold, it is because he was traumatized as a child when he was separated from his floral tributes. Even today, roses, gold and luck can be found together under the soles of our shoes. There's a saying in France and Japan, stepping in poop with your left foot brings luck. What's more, the Japanese word for poop is unko, and the first syllable, un, means luck. And it's led to our most extravagant bunch of flowers yet. Mr. Fuji has made his fortune with roses. I started making gold poop for a joke. Schoolgirls started giving them to their girlfriends, saying, it will bring you luck. And it's now become a phenomenon in Japan. 
Spurred on by his success, Mr. Fuji now put in the lottery. Others have been cured of illnesses. Some have even passed exams, and one school has been selected for a baseball tournament. I receive many letters of appreciation and calls from both young and old. Golden roses have become so popular that it was only a matter of time before someone designed a golden receptacle to receive them. Golden roses can even become works of art. These gold roses imply that gold is excrement. It's the work of artist Francois Bouillon, who is paying homage to the great alchemists who transformed our petals into gold. These flowers were presented in an open coffer and watched over by an armed guard. More than 20 artists have produced rose-related works of art, but Jacques Lizen has made a more personal contribution. He created a masterpiece several meters square, the Wall of Defecation. It was composed of hundreds of bricks, which he painstakingly painted with his own feces. To try to make money with your own crap, I find that a rather joyful thing. Well, of course, you have to control the diet for the tones. It remains a monochrome brown, of course. But to get greenish or reddish tones, if you eat lots of spinach, for example, it goes green. Greens, monochromes, browns, a bouquet of aesthetically pleasing pleasing colours that doesn't always smell as sweet. Some Austrian artists have even created a contraption to film the moment when the bouquet is in full bloom. But there's one man who's taken it a step further. The artist Wim Delvoy is the inventor of Cloaca, a machine that uses real food to produce artificial roses. This intriguing installation consists of tanks connected by tubes and uses carbon dioxide, sugars and acids to recreate the human digestive system. This unique piece of art has only been made possible by the fusion of art and science. My only goal for the machine on a technological side is to produce fecal matter that is biochemically exact, like human, really human fecal matter. The first time I exhibited this machine in Zurich, they complained a bit because they didn't realize that the odor would be so terrible. If there is a bit of diarrhea, it can be controlled. We can have a look on the computer. We can really control things. To produce a big form stool or a bit of diarrhea. Oh, really? Because it starts off like that. In my intestine, is it liquid like that? Yeah. Whenever there's a pocket, it's liquid. It's called chim. That's the word we use for the food after it's been eaten, before it's defecated. This um, poo, how old is it? Uh, it arrived yesterday. It's from yesterday's dinner. And um, how long will it take to come out? How long can we really see just how much it makes? Wow, what a star. <laughs> Most visitors are surprised by the authentic smell and texture of Delvoy's creations. His roses may be machine-made, but that doesn't seem to make them any less vibrant or aromatic. Wim's latest challenge is to feed Cloaca with the fine cuisine of France's great chefs. This is freeze-dried chicken. Yes, yes. With some freeze-dried powdered sauce and all that in a cube of water so it has enough water to swallow and digest all of it. We hope that it will produce a nice poop for us. Oh yes, I'm sure it will. Will this gourmet feast satisfy the 12-meter monster? What about wind? 
Cloaca will present its bouquet in just over 12 hours. Like the food it consumed, it should well be an award-winning deposit. It's never had food like this before. I've kept 200 turds that I'm selling on the internet, and it's going very, very well. The price is 1,500 euros. Now you too can own a very important piece of contemporary art for a bargain price. This matière fecal is ou vendu ou mis dans un société anonyme. This fecal matter is sold, placed in the company Cloaca, whose capital is this fecal matter. Cloaca is now issuing 100 convertible bonds which will be sold in several banks. So people are going to hesitate between keeping the bond or recovering their money or converting the bond into a turd, well packaged of course. Packaged roses? Well, it's not the first time. And lot number 28. Uh, La Merda d'Artista by Piero Manzoni, showing on my left. I could make all sorts of jokes, but I'm going to go to 10, 11, 12, 13,000. It's with me at 13,000 pounds. With me at 13,000 pounds. 14. 14, I'm at now. 14,000 pounds. 19,000 pounds. Further back at 19,000 pounds. I'm selling for 19,000. Can you see further forward at 19,000 pounds? Yours, sir. Thank you very much. 30 grams. Yes, there are 30 grams. Afterwards, he sold the 30 grams. Then he issued stock certificates to sell the 30 grams at the price of gold. At the price of 30 grams of gold. Now, it's worth far more than gold. In 1961, Piero Manzoni claimed he had packaged his feces in 90 cans. He labelled it in several languages, artist shit. Very quickly, the value of his can exploded. Between 1970 and 1980, it was valued at around 1,500 euros. In 1991, during the contemporary art boom, it rose to 58,000 euros. In 1992, it was worth 23,000 euros. And today, over 30,000 euros, which is the price of two kilos of gold. Oh, I bought the can when the, the price was high. <laughs> Uh, more or less uh, uh, 50 million of liras, 50 million. I cannot imagine that uh, really the shit in, the, in 19 can, no, it's not possible for me. Because uh, I think uh, he put like uh, the little stone, uh, powder and uh, so on. There are some workers that we found today who claim to have experimented with the cans. With three friends, they were in a tent and they stirred the shit with a ladle and filled the cans. Other testimonies contradict this version. They may be trying to make the work more acceptable. As long as people talk about them, Manzoni's 30 grams of roses will remain a living artwork that incites curiosity. Where is now the can, my can, in the safe, at the bank? In the bank, yes. Some, some time, uh, my friend asked me to show the can, no? <laughs> because <laughs> they are <laughs> astonished. Artist Bernard Basile has created a video installation in which he questions art collectors. These testimonies constitute a living exhibition of canned art today. Yes, it's amusing. For example, there was one chap who bought a can because he heard about it from a friend. He knew someone who had a can and who kept it on the dining room table and whose wife was sick of it and he had to sell it. The art collector bought the can from that man, and now, in the new collector's home, it's sitting on the dining room table. What gives continuity to the work is this collection of testimonies of people trying to find out what is inside or worrying about potential leakages. It's really sturdy. If all the cans leaked and you were in possession of the only can that didn't leak, then yours would be worthless. In 1989, curiosity got the better of Bernard and he opened a can. Inside was another can of shit. Today his action is regarded as a piece of art. What was inside? 
It has to be seen. I've no doubts. Pier Manzoni is a critic of the consumer society.